Hey guys, what's up? It's uh, me, Miles. I'm doing another rebuttal redo over the uh, compulsory national service topic. Uh, today went pretty rough. I uh, stuttered a lot, didn't really make the best points, and wasn't efficient with my time. So I'm redoing it. This is yet another take. Uh, hopefully this is the one. So I'm just going to get into it. Um, I'm going to start by going over my affirmative case. Uh, and then I'm going to go over my opponent's case. So let's go and begin. In attack my value of social welfare, my opponent argues that a government should always prioritize liberty over anything else. But this isn't the case. A government should be primarily concerned with the well-being of its citizens. Rights aren't protected just so that people can say they have the right to do something. They're protected so that people are happy and so that they are able to enjoy life. A government's ultimate goal is to ensure social welfare. So let's co continue with my case. So my opponent attacks my value criterion of national participation and my contention on civic engagement together, saying that the mandatory nature of national service prevents people from wanting to engage in society. But judge, my evidence explicitly states how the compulsory factor of national service is why it's so effective in having people continue to invest in society. It's because these volunteers identify the long-term impact of the work on the community, it helps them to feel as though they have accomplished something, and finally is that it prepares them for careers by having them to work with other people for a common goal. These three factors are why people continue to invest in their community after this compulsory service period. I'd also like to note how my opponent entirely dropped my argument of how, of how compulsory national service redistributes professionals to rural, rural and underserved areas, which is important because it provides people in need with resources that they would otherwise not have. So one of the most notable factors about compulsory national service that I bring up in my second contention uh, is how it increases the amount of people involved in the military and foreign politics. My opponent argues that the more soldiers increases the risk of more casualties, but the impact is actually the opposite. The, pro the program makes it so that a greater range of people join the military, including people from the middle and upper classes. This inherently increases the amount of people back home with friends and family overseas, broadening the number of citizens engaged in whether the country ought to go to war or not, shifting the way they evaluate costs and benefits of casualties, causing for more deliberation to make sure that the best decisions decisions are being made for our military, making it more effective in its end goals. And finally, a point which my opponent doesn't really attack is how conscript, conscript military would also teach people how to defend themselves, allowing them to protect themselves and their abilities from government, uh, sorry, uh, and their liberties from the government intrusions and people who may tyrannically seek to take the people's rights away. So let's move into my opponent's case. As seen in her value, value criterion, and first contention, my opponent stakes a lot of her case on the idea that autonomy and liberty should never be violated. But the purpose of government would say otherwise, because once again, the very reason of why these rights are upheld in our society is because they allow for the betterment of society. We give up some of these rights and privileges so that the government can ensure that our society can be the best that it can be. If this means requiring or being required to serve in the military or work as some sort of professional in a needy area, then so be it. Providing communities with resources they need and protecting this nation will always be more important than a temporary suspension to autonomy. Finally, with the inherent rise of people helping this nation, my opponent makes an argument in her second contention that the government will abuse the power and will work in their own interests rather than that of the people. But this is false for two reasons. First is that our current military is already being used to protect not only our liberties but by, uh, by fighting terrorists like al-Qaeda or ISIS, uh, but also the liberties of other people. When the draft was used in World War II example, for example, this nation put soldiers on the line to fight against the oppression of the Jewish people and dozens of other minorities, making sure that their liberties and their rights were protected. Second is that the officials making these decisions are all elected by the people and checked by the Supreme Court. This pe the people of this nation will vote for people who will best support their interests and is the duty of the officials to act in that manner. Even in the case where an elected leader does make a poor decision, the citizens can elect a new representative or via Congress have the leader impeached. It's because of these reasons that I bring up that I ask once again for a ballot affirmation. Thank you.